My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Today's video is entitled Surviving Heart Attacks, the Importance of Cardiac Collateralization. The heart is a muscle and any muscle requires a blood supply to function. The heart is supplied by two main blood vessels, the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. The left will further divide into two large branches, the left anterior descending artery that is also known as the LAD, and the left circumflex artery. Each of these vessels will supply a part of the heart, and in combination, these three vessels supply the whole of the heart. When any of these vessels is occluded, the territory supplied by that vessel no longer receives the oxygen it needs, and the cells within that territory will suffocate, and if the occlusion persists, these cells will eventually die. When the cells die, they are no longer able to contribute to the pumping ability of the heart and the heart function will decline. It is therefore logical to say that the single most important factor in terms of prognosis from a heart attack is the size of the affected territory. The larger the territory that dies, the weaker the heart gets. The consequences of death of a large territory include death of the patient, or if the patient is lucky enough to survive the heart attack, they will be left with a severely weakened heart, and that in itself points to a very dim overall prognosis. Now, if the areas within the heart were to receive blood from multiple arteries, and therefore were not dependent on a single vessel, then even if one vessel blocked off, the amount of damage would be minimized because cells within that territory would continue to receive some blood from the other artery. Reassuringly, we now know that the coronary arteries are not isolated end vessels. They give off multiple smaller branches, which in turn give off very tiny branches, which then connect to very tiny branches of the other coronary arteries. So it is theoretically possible for blood to get to areas of the heart which are supplied by an occluded vessel through the branches of another non-occluded vessel. This network of small uh, vessels that connect different arteries together is known as the coronary collateral circulation. Let me give you an analogy. Um, I as you know, uh, work as a cardiologist in York, but I live in a place called Hull. And Hull and York are about an hour away and they're connected by a road called the A1079. And every morning I take the A1079 because it is the most direct and the fastest way for me to get to work. However, if one day I were driving along and suddenly there were an accident on the road and then I would be stuck. There would be a massive traffic jam. I would have nowhere to go because there's nowhere. Uh, I'm stuck uh, at the back. There's cars behind me at the front. I can't move forward and I have no option. I would just have to stay there for as long as it takes to clear that road. If, on the other hand, I started noticing that the A1079 was getting slower and there were roadworks and there were potholes on that road, then what I would probably do is start taking an alternative route to get to my destination. I would probably go down a side road from the A1079 and then go through a network of many tiny country streets, which are likely to be narrow and slow, but I would still eventually get to work. I may get there late, but I would still get there. I wouldn't be completely stuck. These tiny side roads and that network of tiny roads, which ultimately get me to my destination, are analogous to the coronary collateral circulation. So it figures that the magnitude of damage induced by a blocked main coronary artery would be significantly reduced if there was a pre-existing, well-developed collateral circulation. And today I wanted to talk to you about what we know about cardiac collateralization and how we could enhance it. Although we know that collateral vessels exist in the undiseased heart, these vessels tend to be very small and therefore do not allow much blood through them. However, if there is a progressive narrowing of a main blood vessel over a period of time, then that encourages blood to use these collateral vessels. And when this happens, the collateral vessels actually start 
growing to accommodate this extra blood that's going through them. And the diameter of these collateral vessels can increase by as much as five to tenfold. In one experiment, researchers found that the diameter of collateral vessels in uh, someone with normal, undiseased, unobstructed big arteries was only 10 to 200 micrometers. However, in those patients who had narrowed main arteries, these collateral vessels had grown much bigger and their diameter was anywhere between 100 to 800 micrometers. In addition, it is also believed that when a major blood vessel progressively narrows, the chronic lack of oxygen actually stimulates the production of new collateral vessels as well. So the existing collateral circulation gets bigger to accommodate the extra blood, but you also create more vessels. And the crucial point, however, is that it takes time to develop these collaterals. If you have unobstructed coronaries and then suddenly one blocks off, then you won't have enough time to develop collaterals and therefore the amount of damage is more likely to be substantial. However, if you have progressive narrowings, which are getting worse over a course of years, then the chances of having a well-developed collateral circulation are likely to be much greater. This is why it is not uncommon for people like me to see patients who have blocked coronary vessels, but no visible reduction in the pumping ability of the heart because the blockage has developed over time and therefore the blood is still able to get through via a well-developed collateral circulation and hence cells in that territory continue to survive. Uh, a lot of research has therefore focused on methods by which we could improve our coronary collateral circulation and I'd like to discuss the research that has been done so far. The first study is called EXCITE, E-X-C-I-T-E. -E. In this study, researchers took 60 patients with significant coronary artery disease and divided them into three groups. 20 patients were asked to do high intensity exercise for a period of weeks, 20 were asked to do moderate intensity exercise, and 20 were a control group. And the researchers found that the patients who had engaged in exercise had better collateral flow indices compared to patients who did not exercise. We also know that coronary blood flow tends to be maximal when the heart is relaxing, i.e. in diastole. So if we could prolong diastole, prolong the period of time uh, the heart needs to relax by using a pharmacological agent to slow the heart down, then the increased blood flow in the coronaries could increase collateral vessel formation. There was a scientist called Glocler, G-L-O-E-K-L-E-R, and he compared six months of therapy with a heart rate slowing agent called Ivabradine and compared it to placebo and found that Ivabradine was associated with improvement of collateral flow indices, whereas placebo resulted in a worsening of coronary flow indices. There was another scientist called Patel who showed that a significantly larger proportion of patients with significant coronary artery disease with a heart rate of less than or equal to 50 beats per minute had better collateralization compared to patients with a heart rate of greater than 60 beats per minute. Scientists have also been interested in knowing whether we can stimulate collateralization by using stem cells, cytokines, and physical means. Unfortunately, stem cell research still remains in its infancy. There's also been a study using granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, which looked promising initially, but due to adverse effects has not been convincing uh, enough. One very interesting strategy has been the use of a technique called enhanced external counterpulsation, EECP. Here, pressure cuffs are applied to the lower limbs and triggered to inflate to 300 millimeters of mercury when the heart is relaxing. This means that the blood is pushed into the coronary arteries during diastole because you know, the blood is literally during diastole, these cuffs inflate and push the blood back into the coronary arteries. And what they found was that after repeated sessions, totaling 30 hours, it did appear that these patients developed a significantly better collateral circulation. And this is why this is a treatment that is used for the treatment of angina. More blood to the heart, less angina. 
So this is a quick summary of collateralization. Many patients with heart disease are terrified of exercising, but as long as your doctor gives you the go-ahead, in general, exercise is good for you and a great way to enhance the collateral circulation. Thank you so much for listening. I am so grateful for everything that you do for me. All the best.